in the language movement, my experiences, I would like to share some of my experiences too while I talk about this book. Uh, as Cleopat has already mentioned, this book is quite insightful. It gives an opportunity to look into different aspects which are not discussed normally in any of these uh, circles, Kokri circles, may it be Devnagri or may it be Roman. But there are certain insights through which he gives us further information, especially during, uh, through the conversations that he mentions with various leaders and various activists of both the camps, Nagri and uh, Roman. Now we all know in Goa it is Nagri and Roman, but beyond that, Kokni is also written in Kannada, it is written in Persian script, it is also written in Malayalam script. Perhaps the people who read Kokni in Kannada script, the number is much more, much higher than those who read Nagri or those who read Roman. Now his premises, he starts with Partho Chatterjee's assertion about governmentality and the politics of the governed. Now, that framework I found quite interesting because it talks about the current situation in a proper perspective and also like categorizes the Roman Kokni camp as a kind of subaltern which I can't disagree with because as I said earlier I was part of the Kokni movement and when the deliberation is to take place in the office at Trindio uh, Janeiro uh, Road, which was also a Goman Tokpaksh office, that was the it was the headquarters of KPA, Kongri Projeto Awas. And one more person who, that whose name I did not find here in this book, I would like to mention was Matani Saldana. He was very much part of all these deliberations and all these discussions with the Nagri camp as well as Roman camp. Now here Jason, when he gives a framework of people who are governed by a certain set of people and people who are marginalized, who have to protest or who have to come into the street, uh, streets to raise the concerns or to raise their voice, also reminds me of Andre Gunder's friend's uh, definition of center and the periphery, like there are peripheral people and there are people who are the center, who are commanding and who are pushing their own decisions or uh, onto this vast majority of people. So here in this case, as it is, Kongti mass like is very small and within that camp, like compared to other big, uh, large Indian languages, we are small in numbers. But despite that, there are so many camps, we have so many divisions. And within the divisions, there are again subdivisions of caste. That is one of the, I mean, in the title itself you can see, he talks about the caste, the prominent caste. Now, this subaltern position that has been relegated to like this uh, Roman script of people who demand or people who advocate Roman script are belonging to a particular lower strata of the so-called lower strata of the society. I wouldn't say because I wouldn't categorize somebody as higher caste or lower caste. But in the normal or the traditional definition, I would put them as the down product or I would put them as marginalized people who did not have voice, like Cleobach mentioned, who did not have lobby, who did not have powerful people to represent them. Like it is said during, I mean this is slight distraction, during Nehru's time, there was this debate who is the greatest actor and it was Dilip Kumar, it was never Balraj Sahni because Balraj Sahni belonged to Communist Party of India and Dilip Kumar was very close to Congress. So those who are close to the power always get to taste the fruits or get the benefits or get all the concessions and unless and until the concessions are ex I mean, extended as a result of their ability to challenge the status quo. That is another important statement that I find in this book. Now, did we have, did this class, marginalized class, have a kind of ability to challenge the status quo? Yes, they did have. And we saw that during the Kokri movement. And that's where he has quoted as, uh, I mean, quotation of uh, Anand Desai, the name changed. Of course, I wouldn't also take the original name. He says, Gam Kadum 
पांडु आनी खावपाक मात गाम काडू पावलू आनी खावपाक मात पांडु and that is the exact case in this I mean, uh, during the Bokhni agitation. We knew we were on the streets. I was arrested several times during the Bokhni agitation, beaten up by the police. And yes, the masses who were with us were from Sashti or from Bhaktes who had nothing to do with the literary Bokhni, who had nothing to do with the books, who had nothing to do with pedagogy. Of Kogni, but they were simply Kogni lovers. They used to express themselves through Tiyas, through Kantara. Where are these people? And why these people are not part of the kind of benefits that the Kogni is getting today? That is a moot question, and that's the question this book addresses. Fine. Now, this subaltern case, the subaltern kind of status that has been relegated, I mean, that has been, these people have been pushed to is also, I see, a diff, uh, kind of deliberate attempt of certain elites, the so-called elites from both the communities, Hindus as well as Catholics, who did not want to also identify with Konkani, because also we all know that Konkani was known as Ligo Kiriyad, or the servant's language, in during Portuguese time. So, nobody wanted to identify really with it. Everybody wanted to be a Westernized, like, unlike Maharashtra, Maharashtra, you find somebody like Father Francis de Brito, or uh, Cecilia Carvalho, who writes in beautiful language, uh, Marathi, and gets uh, get awards. Father De Brito, in fact, was uh, presided over Marathi Sahitya Sammelan a couple of years ago. Now, that kind of status we do not find here, that kind of situation we don't find here in Goa. That is because the masses always followed the classes. When the upper elite said, yes, it was servant language, masses too, at times, felt shy to express themselves in Kokri, which is very much a fact. We have lots of friends in the college of now too who feel no, we cannot speak in Kokri. And they feel it's a matter of pride to say that. Which I feel also is another cause why they have been pushed into the corner. Because unless and until you have now one more thing, like nobody learns language for the pride of it or for the love of it. People see benefits. Is it beneficial to learn in a particular language? Yes, if it is English, yes, they will go for it. If it is Kogni, they don't get any benefits from it. There are no monetary gains, there are no employment uh, prospects or any other prospects. So why will people simply just because they, their language will go for Kogni? And that's what happened during the uh, media of destruction agitation. We saw it and how these people were pushed as anti-nationals. Now, when Kogni, Romi Kogni was getting developed, in the churches, when Bible was kind of translated in Kongni and it was in Roman script, a lot of people identified with it, like it happened in Maharashtra. It was Reverend Tilak and Ranade who translated Bible in Marathi and they would reach out to a wide a section of people who in turn identified with Christianity. In Goa, a similar thing had happened, but somehow I would say this particular class missed the bus. That is also because of the weak leadership or the faulty leadership which aligned with the Hindu Saraswat or their counterparts and 